Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage. The title of this lecture is Final Statistics Topic, Hypothesis Testing, and Our Final Statistic uh, LSA. As always, please be an attentive learner while watching this video. Here is the Final Statistics LSA. The NCHS report indicated that in 2002, the prevalence of cigarette smoking among American adults was 21.1%. Data on prevalent smoking in N equal 3536 participants who attended the seventh examination of the offspring in the Framingham Heart Study indicated that um, 482 out of the 3,536, which is equal to 13.6% of the respondents were currently smoking at the time of the exam. Suppose we wanted to assess whether the prevalence of smoking is lower in the Framingham offspring uh, sample, given the focus on cardiovascular health in that community. Is there evidence of a statistically lower prevalence of smoking in the Framingham offspring study as compared to the prevalence among all Americans? And this involves a hypothesis test. You're to uh, state the null and uh, alternative hypothesis and use a confidence interval to test this hypothesis and state your conclusion. Let's begin with the definition of hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is a procedure based on sample evidence and probability used to test statements regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. The basic steps in conducting a hypothesis test are these. Make a statement regarding the nature of the population. Now this involves making a claim and uh, turning the claim into either the research hypothesis or the null hypothesis. Collect evidence, sample data, and it has to be a good sample to test the statement, and apply the data to assess the plausibility of the arguments, and we're going to use confidence intervals for this. Because we use sample data to test hypothesis, we cannot state with 100% certainty that the statement is true. Instead, we can only determine whether the sample data support the statement or not. Because the statement can either be true or false, hypothesis testing is based on two types of hypotheses. In this chapter, the hypotheses will be statements uh, regarding the value of a population parameter. Later on, we're going to talk about uh, values of uh, a um, population mean. And since we can do competence intervals for each, we're in good shape. So the null hypothesis, denoted H0, is a statement to be tested. The null hypothesis is a statement of no change, no effect, or no difference, and assumed true until evidence dictates otherwise. This always contains the condition of equality. The alternative hypothesis, denoted H1, read H1, is a statement that we're trying to find evidence to support. So we build null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. If one of them is true, the other one is false, and vice versa. They're alternative states of nature. Now, there are two kinds of errors that you can make in hypothesis testing. Uh, in the real world, the state of nature is H0 could be true, or H1 could be true, not both. And your conclusion is to reject H0 or do not reject H0. Now, if H0 is true and you do not re uh, reject it, that's a correct conclusion. But if uh, H1 is true and you do not reject H0, that's called a type 2 error. An easier error to understand is uh, what happens if H0 is true and you reject H0, that's called a type 1 error. If you reject H0 and H1 is true, it's a correct conclusion. So you can have a type 1 error or a type 2 error. We can illustrate this type 1, type 2 errors by looking at hypothesis testing from the view of a criminal trial. In any trial, the, de the defendant is assumed to be innocent. We give the defendant the benefit of the doubt. The district attorney must collect and present evidence proving that they're either guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. 
Okay, because we are seeking evidence for guilt, it becomes the alternative hypothesis. Innocence is assumed, and so it is the null hypothesis. Now, in a trial, the jury obtains information, sample data. It then deliberates about the evidence, the data analysis. And finally, it either convicts the defendant, rejects the null hypothesis, or declares the uh, defendant not guilty, fails to reject the null hypothesis. Note that the defendant is never declared innocent. That is, the null hypothesis is never declared true. The two correct decisions are to declare an innocent person not guilty or declare a guilty person to be guilty. The two incorrect decisions are to avoid are to convict an innocent person, that's a type 1 error, or let a guilty person go free, that's a type 2 error. It's helpful to think of this way when you're trying to remember the difference between a type 1 error and a type 2 error. And the level of significance alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. And this often is evident in the statement of the problem. We choose what alpha is. So this is the process that we're going to use in this class to talk about hypothesis testing. So we start with a claim and a value of alpha. How often are we willing to be wrong? And what claim are we asserting? Now the claim will either become the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. And then we can construct the other one. Remember that the null hypothesis always has a condition of equality in it. Then we get an appropriate sample and construct an appropriate confidence interval. The confidence interval is based on the value of alpha. If alpha is 5%, we'll do a 95% confidence interval. If alpha is 1%, we will do a 99% confidence interval. And if alpha is 10%, we will do a 90% confidence interval. Then we examine the statement and we examine the null hypothesis and we look at our confidence interval. We will either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then we have to state the conclusion in words. Again, we never accept the null hypothesis because without having access to the entire population, we don't know the exact value of the parameter stated in the null hypothesis. Rather, we say that we do not reject the null hypothesis. This is just like the court system. We never declare a defendant innocent, but rather say that they are not guilty. So once this statement is made, whether or not to reject the null hypothesis, the researcher must state his or her conclusion. It's important to realize that we never accept the null hypothesis. Again, the court analogy helps us with this. If the null hypothesis is H0 is innocent, when the court uh, presents the, uh, the jury, uh, presents a verdict, uh, it could be not guilty. Note that the verdict does not state that they're innocent, it just, uh, that, that their, that the statement of their being innocent is true, states there's not enough evidence to do guilt. That is a big difference. Being told you're not guilty is very different from being told you are innocent. So sample data can never prove the null hypothesis to be true, but by not rejecting the null hypothesis, we're saying that the evidence indicates the null hypothesis could be true. That is, there is not enough evidence to reject our assumption that the null hypothesis is true. A lot of things to think about here. The conclusion in words to a hypothesis test is always as follows. There is or is not sufficient evidence to support and insert the claim. You're never 100% certain with hypothesis testing. Let's look at a couple of examples. So here's a problem. I will read it. Humira is a medication used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. In clinical trials of Humira, 705 subjects diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis were administered 40 milligrams of Humira every other week. Of the 705 subjects, 66 reported nausea as a side effect. It is known that the proportion of RA subjects in similar studies receiving a placebo reported nausea as a side effect uh, of 0 0.8. Does the sample ev evidence represent significant evidence that a higher proportion of subjects receiving Humira 
experience nausea as a side effect in the nose taking a placebo. It says use the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. That means we're going to look at a 95% confidence interval. And the reason we're thinking about bigger is because P hat 66 out of 705 is this number, which is bigger than 0 0.8. So our claim is that P is bigger than 0 0.08. Now that means that this becomes the H1. So P is bigger than 0 0.08. That means that the null hypothesis is P is less than or equal to 0 0.08. So then we know how to construct a confidence interval for this proportion. And we get a lower bound is this number, 0 0.72 and change. And the upper bound is 0. 1, 1, 5 and change. Now we look at this and we say, does that tell us that it is bigger than 0 0.08? Well, no, because 0 0.08 is in this confidence interval. That means we, based on this evidence, fail to reject H0. And the answer is no, the sample does not provide sufficient evidence to support our claim that P is bigger than 0.08. That's actually good news for the Humera subjects. It doesn't mean that you've proven that it isn't more, uh, but you did not prove that it is more. Let's look at another problem. Now that one dealt with proportions. This one's going to deal with the mean. The mean height of American males is 176.3 centimeters. The heights of the 44 male U.S. presidents, that's Washington through Trump, uh, I didn't include the Biden data here, uh, have a mean 180.1 centimeters and a standard deviation of 7.1 centimeters. This is the mean and this is the standard deviation of that um, set of presidents. Treating them as a simple random sample, determine if there is evidence to suggest that U.S. presidents are taller than the typical Americans. And we're going to use alpha equal 0 0.05 level of significance. That means that this is a 95% confidence interval we do. And we've learned how to construct confidence intervals for the mean. That's using the t distribution. If we do that, we find that the confidence interval 95% is, um, well, first of all, our claim is that mu, the mean height of the president, is bigger than 176.3. That becomes our H1. That means H0 is mu is less than or equal to 176.3 centimeters. We construct the confidence interval and we get that the confidence interval is 180.1. That is our X bar plus or minus this. Uh, and that means that the numbers are between 178 and 182. Well, we look and does this confidence interval contain H0 number? And no, it does not. And so that means that what we're doing is we reject H0. And that means that the evidence supports the claim that presidents are taller than the typical American male. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself because self-care is important and of each other because we're all in this together. God bless you 